so much more uh, effects of this happening in the world. So it doesn't make sense to say that the Earth is in motion, and it doesn't help. You don't get a better system if you do that. So Aristarchus was um, rightly ignored. We now look back and think, oh, he was ahead of his time, but not really. He was just kind of crazy. Like, there's no good reason to believe this. Um, but there is a problem. There's definitely a problem. And that's the plants. The planets don't do this nice thing of moving with the sphere of the stars. There are seven planets in the ancient world. The sun, the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. The sun we've already sort of explained. It doesn't follow the sphere of the stars, but it does do its own circle thing. We can explain it with essentially uh, two mechanisms, the sphere of the stars and its own circling movement of some sort. We try to do it, um, people try to do this with the other planets. The moon, you can sort of do. It, uh, it moves around, oh, sorry, I should back up a second. The rest of the planets besides the sun also kind of follow this, this circle, the ecliptic. But they don't do so in a nice way. They, they stay within the zodiac, which is, a, um, which is eight degrees from the ecliptic on either side, is the, the band we call the zodiac. And they stay within that. They don't get very far from the ecliptic. But at the same time, they don't follow it. They're uh, you know, bouncing back and forth between different sides. The moon moves around the zodiac in an average of 27 and a third days, but it can be up to seven hours of different time. Yeah? So the planets, as they move around, they don't follow. This is supposed to be a circle. That's not a circle. That's supposed to be. Um, <laughs> the, the sun follows the circle pretty much perfectly. Around the um, oh, oh, Along the star map. So this is, oh, oh, this, this is the star map. We've got a bunch of stars. We've got constellations. This is Orion. Um, we, have, we have a star map. Um, the sun, rather than just being a nice little star and going uh, around every, 24 hour, or every year in a nice way, moves within the star. So it's following the basic motion, but it's also going to be next to a different star every night, in a sense. And it makes this nice pattern as it does so. The, the stars, on the other hand, just kind of sort of follow it. I'm sorry, the planets. Yes, the planets. Um, they, they stay within the zodiac, which is eight degrees on either side of the ecliptic. So they're basically following the ecliptic. And there's some pattern here, obviously. But at the same time, it's not a simple pattern. It's not just explained by the ecliptic the same way the sun is. So the other planet, the other planets besides the sun, um, are all like act like this. The moon moves around the zodiac in an average of 27 and a third days, but it can be up to seven hours different on each individual um, time. Successive new moons are an average of 29 and a half days apart, but again, that's only approximate. It can be very different between um, times. Um, new moons, uh, the new moon travels about 30 degrees around. Uh, the zodiac, because the time between new moons is longer than the time it takes to go around the zodiac. So we've got some basic patterns. But again, it, the, it's more complicated. The Babylonians had pretty much figured out how to calculate the position of the moon by the third century BC. It's more complicated than the sun. But they had worked out techniques for predicting exactly where it would be and how long it would take. So the moon, while not as well explained as the sun, was still manageable. But the other five planets, the things we would now call planets, um, were harder. They did lots of weird stuff. They did the th same things the moon did, where they didn't stay with the zodiac, and their, um, the time they went around the zodiac or was uh, take longer or shorter, depending. But they also did something else, which was even worse. They don't move at a consistent speed. And I don't just mean that they slow down and speed up. In some cases, a planet will be moving and double back on itself for a while and then keep moving. The, this is just bad. This should not happen. We don't expect this to happen. The sun, it moves in a nice little circle. The moon moves in a nice little circle too, just a little more complicatedly. But the, re the other five planets, what's going on? So they, this, this was the major problem of astronomy in the ancient world, was explaining the planets. Um, the planets are all qualitatively similar. I'm going to make this distinction between qualitative and quantitative. Qualitatively means that um, essentially they have the same basic patterns of moving along the zodiac in some sense, having retrograde motion, and this sort of thing. They're quantitatively very different. They move around the zodiac in very different amounts of time. Um, and 
but they're qualitatively similar, with one important distinction. Two of the planets, uh, Mercury and Venus, are what are called inferior planets, meaning that they never get very far from the sun. Specifically, they never get more than 45 degrees away from the sun. Um, the other three planets um, do, Mars, uh, Saturn, and Jupiter. They do get further from the sun. And so this was a distinction that could be drawn, but no one really knew how to explain it. But other than that, the five planets are essentially, they, they have the same qualitative features. Um, but let's step back for a second. This is a problem. But look what we've got so far. We've already got a system where we can explain the motion of the stars. We can explain the motion of the sun. We can pretty much explain the motion of the moon. And we can sort of explain the motion of the planets. It does all sorts of weird things, but they're still moving around the zodiac. They're still, uh, they still have an average time around the zodiac, even if it changes. They still have an average speed, even if they're sometimes going backwards. We've got a system that explains the majority of phenomena. And so we've got a system with a lot of promise. We've got a system with a lot of predictive power, a system that can be used for navigation. We've got a very powerful system, in other words. It's got problems, and the ancients realize this. But this is a strong base. We've got a, we've got a system by which we can begin to understand that. And we even um, uh, can start to talk about relative distance of between the planets, because the, it was expected that the planets with a longer amount of rotation were further from the Earth. And they got, it, they got a system that was essentially right. I mean, the uh, Earth in the center, surrounded by uh, Mercury, uh, uh, Venus, the Moon, the Sun, <coughs> uh, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter. And this pattern, while the moon and the sun are obviously in the wrong place, we would say now, you know, had some, had some it made sense. And there were, there were good reasons to believe this. So we can do a lot of things. We can start to talk about astronomy in a very detailed way. But obviously there are problems. So how did we fix these problems? One uh, proposition was uh, by a guy named Eudoxus. And he explained planets with more spheres. Um, the sun and moon get one each because their, their motions can be explained by essentially one circle. But something like Jupiter gets four spheres. And the spheres are homocentric, meaning that they're, they're all centered around the Earth. And they rotate in di around different axes and with different speeds. And by changing the, the <coughs> axes and the speeds, you can, and saying that the planet is an, uh, inf affected by all of them, you can get a lot of different types of motion. You can get speeding up and slowing down, and you can even get retrograde motion. Now, this particular device was not actually used very much in the ancient world. It was gone within about a century. But it's important for one reason. It's important because Aristotle picked it up. And Aristotle was very influential. And I'll get back to him a, later. But um, I just wanted to point out before I go further with the technical stuff that a, this alternative hypothesis of homocentric spheres was important for philosophical reasons. But that wasn't particularly important in technical astronomy. It got ignored pretty quickly. Instead, we got epicycles. Epicycles are cool. I like epicycles. Uh, <laughs> what an epicycle is, is you've got the Earth here in the center, and you've got a orbit of something around the Earth. Well, this is a planet of some sort. This doesn't work. We've already said, seen that. So instead, we get what's called an epicycle. The center of the epicycle is on this circle around the Earth. But the planet, is on the uh, edge of the epicycle. And the epicycle is turning as the whole thing is turning. And this allows for more complicated motion. Uh, you don't expect to see um, constant speeds from the Earth if you've got these two different motions going on at once. Specifically, as, the, as it's moving on this half, in the same, uh, let's say that everything's rotating this direction, and the epicycle is as well. As it is on this top half, the uh, the planet will seem to be moving faster than you would expect, because it's got two motions doing the same thing. On this half, it'll be moving slower than you would expect. And if you get it slow enough, it'll even start to move backwards for a second, and then move faster again. There's something I should have told you uh, earlier about retrograde motion, which is very interesting. They found that as they observed retrograde motion, planets were always brighter when they were in retrograde motion, meaning they were closer. This is just true, that this is an observed fact that they didn't know how to explain. This explains it. As it is inside the circle, it is both closer and moving in retrograde motion. This is an incredibly predictive tool. It not only predicts the correct uh, 